Welcome to Life at the Academy, a midshipman-produced podcast that examines how the culture, traditions, and daily life at Annapolis have evolved over time. I'm Midshipman Nels Waranimi. I first heard the name Craig L. Simons in my plebe or freshman naval history class. As I got the syllabus on the first day of class and I began to look at the schedule of readings over the semester, I kept on seeing the name Simons, followed by the number of pages that we were supposed to read that night. I can't say I took much note of the name at the time, but then as it came around to that point in the semester when we began to research for our plebe naval history essays, I kept on running into sources authored by Dr. Craig L. Simons, and so I began to wonder who he is. I discovered, and I was surprised to discover this, that he was actually a professor at the Naval Academy, and then I discovered that he's one of the more legendary professors, perhaps in the history of the Naval Academy. And then I realized that he's a prolific scholar as the author or editor of 29 books. And so when our team got together thinking about doing a podcast about the history of the culture of the Naval Academy, we knew that we had to talk to Dr. Craig L. Simons as one of our guests. And so before I go any further, allow me to introduce you to Craig L. Simons. He is Professor of History Emeritus at the United States Naval Academy. Professor Simons received his Ph.D. in history from the University of Florida, He served as the Ernest J. King Distinguished Professor of Maritime History at the U.S. Naval War College from 2017 to 2020, and Professor of Strategy at the Britannia Royal Naval College from 1994 to 1995. During a 30-year teaching career at the U.S. Naval Academy, Professor Simons served a four-year term as department chair and held the Class of 1957 Distinguished Chair of Naval Heritage from 2011 to 2012. He was the first person to win both the Class of 1951 Civilian Faculty Award for Excellence in Teaching and the Civilian Faculty Award for Excellence in Research, and he also received the Naval Superior Civilian Service Award on three occasions. Professor Simons is the author or editor of 29 books, including prize-winning biographies of Civil War figures Joseph E. Johnston, Patrick Claiborne, and Franklin Buchanan. His book, Decision at Sea, Five Naval Battles That Shaped American History, won the Theodore and Franklin D. Roosevelt Prize in Naval History. He also wrote Lincoln and His Admirals, Abraham Lincoln, the U.S. Navy, and the Civil War, which won the Benjamin Berendis Award, the Daniel M. and Marilyn W. Laney Prize, the John Lyman Book Award, the Gilder Lehrman Lincoln Prize, and the Abraham Lincoln Institute Book Award. And that's only the beginning of a long list of awards and distinctions that he received over his career and is still receiving. But before turning to our conversation with Dr. Simons, we thought it would be interesting to hear from the perspective of one of his former students. He was engaging. We spoke with Commander Benjamin B.J. Armstrong, who is currently a permanent military professor in the History Department at the Naval Academy, and who's also a former search and rescue and special warfare helicopter pilot who has earned its Ph.D. in war studies from King's College in London. We asked him what it was like to have Dr. Simons as a professor. Kind of the famous class, the most famous class that Professor Simons taught, at least during my time here at the Academy, was his Civil War history class. And it included a pretty famous movement order, which was for a staff ride up to Gettysburg. And I think describing what that was like is a great illustration of what taking a class from Craig Simons was like. Because you'd reach a a portion of the battlefield, and he would leap up on top of a, a cannon and a caisson, holding a giant poster board of a map showing troop movements, and just begin teaching the class right there on the battlefield. We then asked what it is in particular about Dr. Simon's style that allows him to be both a successful scholar and an engaging teacher. He was, he is, he still is, an incredibly narrative historian and in essence a great storyteller. So his classes in large measure were dominated by lecture, but they were so attention-grabbing and they would capture your attention because he is such a great storyteller in his own right that it didn't feel like a classroom lecture at all. And so his classes were uh, pretty consistently oversubscribed, right? Lots of students wanted to take him. He was Mr. Naval History here at the Academy for decades. 
Commander Armstrong described Professor Simon's distinctive style of lecture. As you'll soon hear in the interview, Professor Simons talked about the importance of having the midshipmen close the learning loop during a lecture. Commander Armstrong remembered this as well. There was often, you know, in his storytelling, there would be the, the pause with the question, right, to try and get you to make that next leap, that next connection for yourself before he would pick up and carry on again. I think one of the indications of his reputation as a teacher uh, came in 1991, long before I was here at the Academy as a student. Um, but when Harrison Ford was preparing to play the role of Jack Ryan in the movie Patriot Games, uh, where Jack Ryan is a professor at the Naval Academy and teaches history, he came and spent time in Craig Simon's classroom. And there's actually photos of this in the archive over in, in Special Collections in Nimitz, but he spent the entire day here at the Naval Academy following Doc Simons around to see what it was like to be a history professor so he could embody that when he played the role. And there's photos of him sitting in class. There's photos of them having coffee together in Professor Simons' office. Um, and so when, when Harrison Ford wanted to know what it meant to be a Naval historian and to teach at the Academy, Craig Simons was the guy he learned from. In spite of the demand for his classes, Commander Armstrong told us that they weren't necessarily easy. He had a reputation for being very tough on students. You know, this was not an easy A. This might not even be an easy B. But despite that, his classes always filled. There were waiting lists. People wanted to take his classes, regardless of how hard he was going to make them work, maybe because of how hard he was going to make them work. As the author or editor of 29 books, there's no doubt but that Dr. Simons is a prolific scholar and author. But we asked Commander Armstrong how it is that anybody over the course of their career can write that number of books, and what it is in particular about Dr. Simons that allowed him to keep the rhythm. I, I have no idea. I wish I knew. I wish I could crack that code. There, there are stories here in the department that I've heard from my colleagues that, you know, particularly when, when Dr. Simons was the department chair, you might have a problem and you'd go to the chair's office to talk with him about it. You'd knock on the door and he'd wave you in while he was busy typing at something. And he'd turn to them and say, okay, what's the issue? And you'd go solve the problem and he'd come back to his desk, he'd turn to the keyboard and he'd just start typing again. He had a rhythm is the best thing that I can guess. But uh, I have asked him myself some of the tricks to try and learn from. And I have to admit that I think sometimes a lot of us uh, don't really know how we do some of it. But just dedication to his craft and, and constancy of the work, I think, are really important things when it comes to producing such a, such a huge amount of scholarship. Dr. Simons was not only the guy to learn from, but he also left an impact on the department. Commander Armstrong told us about this as well. During his time here at the Naval Academy, right, so he was hired in the early 1980s, late 1970s is a time period when the faculty, and, and in particular the history department faculty, really professionalized. All the new hires had PhDs instead of maybe just master's degrees in military experience, which was how the department tended to be staffed in earlier decades, say the 1960s. And he was here during that era of professionalization, and in reality he led that era of professionalization with his own scholarship, his own productivity. And so he exemplified that professional historian identity that the department has really grown into to become the home of a lot of historians and professors that are really leading scholars of their fields. With that perspective from one of his former students, now let's turn to our interview with Dr. Simons. Joining me today will be midshipman Peter Shainer. Dr. Simons, thank you very much for joining us today. My pleasure. We'd like to begin with some of your experiences as a professor at the Naval Academy, specifically beginning with one of the people who seemed to be your mentor at the beginning of your career, Professor E.B. Potter. Could you tell us about some of the experiences you had with him and the lessons that you learned from him? I remember when I was first hired here at the Academy and I showed up my first day of work about a week before classes began in 1976. Um, Professor Thompson, who had just taken over as department chair, was escorting me around the floor deck, 
and indicated to me the, there were a number of offices that were available. And the first one he showed me, I said, this looks fine. Uh, I'll, I'll take this one. And he'll say, okay, there's no window. And I thought, that's all right, I can live without a window. And he said, all right, in this office, you will have to share a telephone with the professor across the hall. And I said, well, who's that? And he said, Ned Potter. So Ned and I, uh, he was across the hall from me, but we shared a telephone, which was an interesting experience because he got calls from lots of folks. And of course, he'd been here teaching since before the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. So he had a long memory. And um, he was also in charge of what was called then, and maybe still is for all I know, Charm School. Charm School was for new professors, both civilian and military, who would meet weekly, usually at lunch, sometimes after classes were over, uh, to talk about ways to approach the material. Uh, and what Ned did for me was share with me his 40-some years of experience uh, in terms of what works with midshipmen, what tends not to work with midshipmen, jokes that you can use with midshipmen, most of which, alas, I have now forgotten or I'd be happy to share them with you. Um, but we overlapped uh, for only a year or two, uh, although we remained friends after that, and I visited him after his retirement in his home up on Pendennis Mountain uh, until just about until he passed away, about 10 years after that. So, sir, if you don't mind me asking, what does work with midshipmen and what doesn't work? Well, lectures are not great. Uh, you guys know this, of course. Um, you can't stand up there and dispense information like you're some kind of walking encyclopedia. And that's, that's the easiest fallback method for a brand new instructor because you are in control of a classroom. You know where it's going. You've got your material right there and you can just go. But you have to develop the confidence to, to invite the midshipmen into the conversation. And if you don't do that, one, you will lose the midshipmen. And number two, you don't really understand what's getting through and what's not. If it's only a one-way street, you're throwing stuff into the classroom, but you have no idea how much of it is getting through. So I think that was very helpful. Professor, the uh, responsibilities of professors here, such as grading papers, are far greater than those at other universities. In addition, there's not a chance to work with graduate students. Why did you choose to stay at the academy throughout your whole career? And what was it like to work at the Naval Academy? Yeah, I have said this, I don't know, at least 100 times to people who have asked me that teaching at the Naval Academy is the best job on the planet. It's absolutely, I mean, yes, you're right. There's no graduate students. You won't have people uh, who are very many people. I have had some midshipmen who've gone out and gotten PhDs and become professors and department chairs and all sorts of other things. So it does happen, but it's unusual. By and large, you are teaching, but what I am, I believe, is a teacher. Uh, and being in the classroom, smallish classrooms, 18 to 24, although I did have classes of 30 on occasion, um, you really connect with the midshipmen. And I just loved every moment of it and uh, would not have traded it for Harvard or Yale or any other place that had lots and lots of graduate students. Mm -hmm. Professor, this is backtracking just a little bit. From a, as an outside observer, it seems that there is a little bit of parallelism between your career and the career of Professor Potter. Mm. Would you agree with that? Or No, actually, I wouldn't. Ned uh, was really the last of a generation of people who'd come here. Not that the, meal, the, the, the union ticket matters a whole lot, but did not have PhDs, most of them, um, and who were here... Um, not expected to produce research. Ned did, of course. He wrote the, famously the book on, on Chester Nimitz. Of course, he supervised and wrote much of the Sea Power book that was the text here for two decades and more. Um, but by and large, it was almost like um, an elevated junior college in terms of the academic expectations. Yes, there was lots of individual grading, as you mentioned, um, but by and large, there was not the expectation when I first got here that people would produce books or original research or academic articles that were peer-reviewed. Um, people who had a PhD were unusual. That was changing just as I arrived. I think Larry Thompson, who was department chair in his first year as department chair when I got here, was instrumental in changing not only the department but the entire academy from 
kind of a trade school, if you would, to a legitimate, high-powered academic institution that had expectations of original research as well as effective teaching. So I, I think Ned and I had very different experiences in that respect. Um, so I, I, the parallelism that we have is we're both naval historians. We're both interested and ended up writing books about Chester Nimitz. Um, but I, I think our, in terms of our academic life experiences, they're actually quite different. Interesting. Could you tell us more about the department chair you referenced? Was that his aim when he came here to transform the academy, or did that just happen? The answer is both, uh, yes to both of those questions. I think he did come here with an idea that he looked around, saw who was here. They were mostly um, veterans, I was going to say of the Second World War, but some of them of pre-World War II era. Um, and, and they did not have, they did not attend the American Historical Association. They didn't subscribe to the American Historical Review. They didn't do very many researched articles, very few books. Uh, and I, he had come from Wisconsin, which had a tradition going back into the 19th century of being a very high-powered academic environment, especially in graduate school. And, and I think it was part of his goal to bring about that revolution. But, of course, he had help from people outside the department as well. So I think it did just happen because others cooperated with that ambition. I think superintendents of that era recognized that if we were going to keep up as an institution and attract the students who might otherwise go to Yale and Princeton, that we had to be something a little bit different from what we were. Uh, and I think Larry Thompson, uh, Larry V. Thompson, had a lot to do with that. As a widely published historian, how has your work been shaped by your connection to the Academy? Well, <laughs> that's a great question. Well, obviously, I've done a lot of work in naval history. But I had been doing naval history since before I arrived here. So I was hired as a naval historian. You mentioned that uh, I, I had a parallel with Ned Potter in some respects. And that is clearly one of the parallels. We were naval historians when I first came here. The two-semester naval history course was the only required history course at the academy. There was no Western Civ that was part of the core. Um, so it, naval history was the heart and soul of what we did, and that's who I was. So that certainly had an impact there. But the other thing was that we didn't have anyone who had been trained in the Civil War, and I had done research in the Civil War era, so I became the Civil War historian almost by default, and taught that for 25 years here. And that obviously led me into doing research. I mean, you think you teach the Civil War, you think about the Civil War, questions arise, you pursue those questions, and that may result in an article or in some cases in a book. So I published a number of books, half a dozen books, about the Civil War, not necessarily naval, biographies of uh, Joseph E. Johnston, Patrick Claiborne, who were Confederate generals, both of them very controversial for quite different reasons. Uh, I would not have written either of those had I not been teaching the Civil War course. Uh, but of course, all this time I was also teaching the Naval History course, and that led me to ask questions about Naval History and to write works about Naval History. So I think the connection is not just being at the Naval Academy, but if you are serious about your work, if, if what you're teaching matters to you, it triggers questions you want to pursue. And so obviously teaching both the Civil War and Naval History led me into doing books on those two subjects. Dr. Simons, looking back at your years at the Naval Academy, is there a moment as a professor that you look back on with pride? Oh gosh, lots. Um, <laughs> Every time a midshipman came up to me after the grades were in, because they didn't want to suck up to me beforehand and said, Professor, I want you to know that class changed my life. Uh, that's unbelievable feeling to hear that. To get phone calls 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from people who say, you know, I was just reading one of your books. It reminded me of of your class and I was thinking about how that mattered so much to me at the time and has since and I just wanted to call you and tell you that. Wow! Amazing. Um, I remember when I was notified that I had won the Teaching Excellence Award. That was very gratifying. I remember the last class I taught in this building, it was a HH 262 class, a seminar, sophomore seminar class down in 
what they call G14 now. I've forgotten what the number was in those days, sitting around a table. And I was coming to the end of the class. There was a knock on the door, and a Marine major came in and said, uh, Professor Simons, there's some people here who want to say goodbye to you. And I walked out into the hallway and the stairway all the way up to the second floor and all the way down to the other end of the hall was packed with midshipmen to say goodbye to me. So yes, of course there are moments that, that I remember with particular fondness, quite humbling moments, yeah. Professor, you've had the chance to teach Naval officers at two very distinct stages of their development. How do you compare your teaching at the academy to your teaching at the Naval War College? Yeah, that's a great question, actually, and, and it's both different and the same. Um, let me see if I can follow up on that response. Uh, curiously, I taught first at the Naval War College. Uh, I don't know if you know this or not. I had active duty experience. I was a flag lieutenant for the president of the Naval War College back in the early 70s, toward the end of the Vietnam War. And... Uh, when he retired and was replaced by Stansfield Turner, who came in to teach a course on strategy, but that was based on historical case studies, originally called history and strategy, now called strategy and policy, um, we kind of cobbled together that course. And I taught that one year in uniform as a JG, teaching mostly captains, some commanders. Uh, and then a year, uh, they asked me to stay for a year after I finished my obligated service, stay for a year as a civilian. So I taught two years at the War College before I came to the Naval Academy. So I already had that experience in my mind, and I think that helped me internalize what Ned and others taught me about teaching here, which is that you have to be part of the learning circle yourself. Uh, you can't stand up there and just say, I know stuff, here it is, write it down. Because when you're teaching captains and you're a JG, you are part of that group. I mean, I, I worked like a dog those two years because, boy, was I not going to embarrass myself in front of these guys. Um, so I think that helped me a lot. Uh, and I think the idea of cooperative, collaborative learning is central to education at almost any level. But, of course, the other difference is that you, have, you can assume more about cultural embeddedness, if that's even a word, with the senior officers than you probably can with midshipmen and particularly plebes. I found that here you had to explain background and context before you asked the question that required them to evaluate what it was you were really trying to get to because they just didn't have the, the information, the data. Case in point, um, I found early on teaching here that midshipmen often came from schools where they all took AP courses and therefore were doing thoughtful, analytical, uh, detailed work without having to learn all the stupid stuff like name the states, what are the capitals, what are the largest rivers, what are the bodies of water. They didn't know this stuff. Um, and so in teaching the Civil War course, I would talk about, uh, you know, South Carolina was one of the big troublemakers in the years before the Civil War. They couldn't find South Carolina on a map, I mean, unless they were from South Carolina. And even then, maybe not. So one of the differences is you have to make sure that your students, at whatever level you're dealing with, have the rudimentary uh, information before you can become analytical and thoughtful uh, about that information. I hope that's responsive. So are the conversations more stifled, do you think, at the when you're teaching captains and, and commanders rather than plebes? No, I don't think it is. I think you have to set an environment early on that in which you make it clear that I expect to hear from you as much as you expect to hear from me. And one of the hard things to do there is to wait out the students at any level. Yeah, you probably happened to you. A professor will ask a question. Nobody says anything. How long do you let that silence go with people kind of squirming in their seats? I have known professors here who would wait 10, 15 seconds, which seems like two hours, until finally midshipmen say, well, it might be this. And the professor would say, that's interesting. Any other thoughts? And everybody would go, oh, God, we have to do this again. So... So encouraging conversation has to be set up early on, or the midshipmen, or for that matter, the war college students, 
won't get it. If you walk in and say, I don't expect you to respond, I expect you to listen to me, that's what will happen. So I think it's the environment that you establish uh, in that classroom in that first week. Um, I remember, I'll tell one quick story about teaching as an ensign uh, to a group of captains, and I was the seminar leader, I was the professor. And uh, I asked an open-ended question like that, and there were a few seconds of silence, and finally some officer said, well, yes. Well, I obviously needed some elaboration to that, so I said, well, yes, what? He said, oh, I'm sorry, yes, sir. Because nobody knew what the rules were when an ensign is teaching captains. Uh, so you have to figure out what those rules are, and then you're, no, 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 I'm just kidding. Call me Craig, I'll call you Bill, and we'll, we'll figure this out. Uh, so I think it's the environment that you establish, the idea that you are all here to learn something together. I've had more years working at it than you have, but you may have some great ideas that help me see those things differently. Let's figure this out. So looking back at your time at, at the academy and then comparing that to what you see today, what do you think is the most significant change in midshipman culture between those two? I think it is much more academic today in orientation. In 1976, uh, I think the brigade on that side of the yard, that is to say on the Bancroft Hall side of the yard, mattered almost exclusively. You wanted to be sat. You wanted to be above 2.0. The old line was 2.5 and survive, but 2.0 and survive would get you there. Uh, but you didn't want to get hammered in the hall. That was the big thing. And I think that's moved. Uh, now, I've been retired for 16 years now, so I don't know where it is today, but from the time I started till the time I left, the idea that academic success mattered became more important in a, in a balancing way with whether or not your first E was going to yell at you because your uniform was out of line or some damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that has changed, uh, and I think it's for the better, and I think one of the reasons it's changed is because the hall and the, uh, the military leadership, the soup, the don, bought into the idea that academics matter. Yeah, you can have the shiniest shoes and the squared away, most squared away uniform anybody ever saw, but if you can't hack it in the classroom, you're not going to be as successful an officer, not just as successful a student, but as successful an officer as you would be. And I think because the institution bought into that, it has elevated and reinforced uh, the academics. Sir, that's really a central question of what we're trying to answer here, because what Admiral Nimitz, who you've worked with, when he t attended the academy, it meant something very different to him than what it means to us today. I suppose the implicit question is, is the academy still graduating the Admiral Nimitzes of the world with the change in, in system? Was there some special magic in whatever went on back in Bancroft Hall when it's changed, that magic has been lost? No, I don't think that's the case. I'll give you a short answer, and then I will try to elaborate on that by saying that um, the Navy was a smaller institution in 1901 when Chester Nimitz graduated. Everybody knew each other. That officer corps was tight. Everybody had a nickname. They don't do this anymore. You guys have nicknames that upperclassmen gave you when you were a plebe? Not really, sir. When I worked for Admiral B.J. Sims, who was a vice admiral, I was his flag lieutenant, and I would write his letters, and, and he would tell me, write so-and-so and tell him this and that. He was from Georgia. Write him and tell him, and you do, I tell him I want to do this. So I'd write up the letter, you know, Dear Admiral Jones, whatever it might be. And, then, and he'd get it, and he'd look it over, and he'd take a pen, and he'd cross out Admiral Jones and write, Stinky! <laughs> or Flatfoot, or Fuzzy, you know, whatever the guy's academy nickname was. They all knew each other. They all knew each other by those nicknames. It was like a fraternity, almost. It's bigger than that now. The, the brigade is bigger. It's twice as big as it was in 1901. You don't all have these ridiculous nicknames. Uh, so it's, it's less of a, you told me not to tap the table, but I'm going to do it. It's less of a <laughs> ring knocker environment now than it was in 1901. So in terms of academics, uh, I think the academics are much more severe today. Uh, whether uh, it's necessary, for example, that everybody pass differential equations in chemistry to be successful marine is an issue that's been kicked around all over the place. Um, 
I do believe, I absolutely believe that it's essential to have a deep understanding of history. I say that as an historian, but also as an American, because it gives you that context to understand broad-based issues of command and control and, and leadership uh, that may or may not be embedded in chemistry or differential equations. Um, but I think that Nimitz was successful because of his temperament as much as because of his education. Uh, he had a temperament that allowed him to be patient, uh, to be thoughtful, not to have a knee-jerk reaction, not to smack people, uh, to listen as much as to talk. Those things, uh, you can teach some of it, but some of that is inherent. Uh, now, his generation, of course, did extraordinarily well in terms of climbing the ladder of success, but the reason for that is his generation graduated 20 years before the biggest war in the history of the world. Uh, elevations. I mean, you entered the war uh, in 1941 as a lieutenant. You almost certainly exited four years later as a captain. In any other four-year period in American history, that would not have been true, except the Civil War. Okay. I had a colleague, Professor Fred Herod, who also lives in town and you might talk to. Uh, Professor Herod used to tell his students, he said, the single most important factor that determines whether you will make flag rank has already been decided, your birth year. Because if a big war comes out when you're 15 years after graduation, you're probably going to make flag. Otherwise, it's coin toss. Professor, what values have you sought to instill in midshipmen through your teaching and how did that change over time? I don't know that they changed over time. They probably did change over time because I learned more about the brigade and the climate and, uh, and the Navy, for that matter. So therefore, it was possible for me to streamline and address my approach to historical problems uh, in ways that I think would connect and resonate with midshipmen. But the values, I don't think, did change. Uh, obviously, there are a number of values that are inherent to the brigade itself. You know, honesty, trustworthiness, uh, relying on one another, openness. But in addition to that, uh, there is a tendency then and now to say, yes, sir, yes, sir, three bags full. I can make that happen. Uh, sometimes you can't. And I think it's important to... Uh, I tried to get them to understand that honesty more than, yes, sir, I can do it, uh, will contribute more, I think, to effective uh, command leadership than simply trying to bluff your way through a circumstance. So uh, directness, patience, honesty, um, empathy, the ability to listen, the willingness to listen to juniors as well as to peers and to seniors. I think sometimes in certain military environments, the notion that an 04 is necessarily smarter than an 02 is not always the case, and 04s need to remember that. Sir, you were appointed as a professor the same year that women, I believe it was the same year that women were first um, admitted to the Naval Academy. How did that change the culture of this institution? Yeah, when I first walked into a classroom here in 1976, there was a woman in that HH-100. It wasn't called that. HH-100, I think it was then, the first semester of the two-semester naval history course taught to plebes. Um, and I remember thinking even then how what a, what a stark minority they were. You know, in psychology, somewhere around 20 percent is when – you say, oh, they're just part of the, the group. But when you're 5%, 4%, you stand out so much. And the women who came here knew they were being watched. They knew there were people who expected them to fail. There were people who wanted them to fail. There were other people who might cut them slack, and they didn't want slack cut for them. So it, it, you could feel the tension, I think, in the brigade dynamic about the arrival of women, and that was because it was just plebes. Uh, there were jokes like, oh, they issue a, a varsity sweater to every female plebe as soon as she shows up, because, of course, they started varsity sports. And there were only, what, 120, 150, I don't know what the number is, women 
in the entire brigade. Everybody was in a sport. Everybody was on a team. Well, the men who had tried out for teams and not made it were snarky about that. Uh, so, yeah, there were things that had to be overcome. Those first four years were tough. And, and the next four years were slightly less tough and slightly less tough and so on. Uh, and I think, it, you know, in, in those 30 years from the time I started till the time I left, uh, I could feel the dynamic change. Were you aware of some of the things that were going on back in Bancroft Hall at that time? Somewhat. Um, not in detail, no. I have to be honest. I think one of the things that's absolutely critical to do here when new faculty arrive, particularly new civilian faculty who didn't have military experience, I did. I had gone through boot camp and OCS and I'd been an officer and I'd, so I had that in my quiver as well as my academic experience. But those who come here without that need to be invited to lunch in Bancroft Hall sometime in their first semester so they can just see it. They need to, to, to figure stuff out because they don't know, it, especially when you're new. There's two separate cultures, less so now, I think, than then, but you can perhaps decide that for yourself, that the Bancroft Hall culture had one set of rules and values and the academic side had a different one. Here, here's an anecdote that I'm reminded of. There was one year, I don't remember the year, sometime in the late 80s, early 90s, where whatever class it was that was running the plebes that summer decided that when they wanted to ask a question, they should put their arm in the air at a 45 degree angle and fisted. That's still done? Uh, yes, sir, it is. It's called sticking a paw out. Yes. Well, well of course. Not the, not the 45, not the 45 degree, degree. angle. Well, it looked altogether too much like a Mussolini yeah. meeting to me. So well, the first class and I ask a question and a hand goes up like that. What the hell is that? So that, I think, helps explain the cultural difference between their, the, the plebes are trying to abide by the rules that are enforced upon them in Bancroft Hall and then also adapt to the rules they're expected to abide by on this side of the yard. And that, that compromise needs to be made. And it can't be so stark, so different, that they blow one or the other off. You know, it's so easy to say, well, geez, that stuff in Bancroft Hall, that's just crap. That, that's not real. Or that stuff on the academics, you know, that's just, I got, got to get over that bar. That didn't really mean anything. That's just another barrier they put in my way to getting where I need to go. Uh, both sides have to recognize that there has to be some overlap, if you're looking at a Venn diagram, where the two sides say, these are values that are pertinent to both sides. There's an ongoing conversation on whether or not to rename the Buchanan House. Mari Hall, in fact, is in the process of being renamed. As an author of a biography on Franklin Buchanan, do you have any opinions on this? Sure, I have an opinion about that. Um, you know, I hope, that Buchanan House was not named Buchanan House until the 1970s. That's not a hoary tradition that goes back to the founding of the Naval Academy in 1845. Were that the case, then I might have a different answer to this question. But the, a superintendent came in, uh, I'm not sure who it was, and said, uh, this house doesn't have a name, it's just called the Soup's House. Well, who was the first superintendent? Buchanan. Okay, we're going to call it Buchanan House. Um, I think it, it, the Soup's House is just fine with me. I think taking Buchanan's name off it doesn't demean it in any way, doesn't demean him in any way. Um, so, yeah, my opinion is that the Soup's House is a good name for the Soup's House. What aspect of brigade culture would you like to see preserved into the future? I think the, uh, I think the brotherhood, and I know we're mixed gender. I'm using brotherhood in a generic sense, um, that we suffered this together. I'm looking at a photo on the wall behind you of the climbing of Herndon. Um, that we suffered this not only plebe year, but the four years by the Severn together. Uh, and, and that's a bond that I think is worthwhile. Uh, the difficulty is, being an OCS product myself, it, it's not uh, a good thing if the bond is so strong that it excludes uh, commissioning sources from NROTC or OCS. But, but I think it's a valuable thing to, to have that shared experience. 
I do have one final question. Yeah. We've, we've touched or danced around it throughout this interview, but what we're trying to do is, is do a historical analysis of culture at the Naval Academy. If someone asked you who's never been to the Academy to describe the culture of the brigade, what would you tell them? We did touch upon this issue a little bit when I was talking about the differentiation between the hall and the academic side and the importance of making sure everybody's on the same team. Uh, how would I describe it to an outsider? I would say that midshipmen uh, work extraordinarily hard because everybody says, don't let down on me. I expect you to do this in the hall. I expect you to do this in the athletic field. I expect you to do this in the lab. I expect you to do this in the classroom. And everybody has a high standard. And one of the complaints I have about the academy is that if every one of those compelled a midshipman to live up to the standards that person set, there aren't enough hours in the day. And I'll tell you what that contributes to. It contributes to a mental set where a midshipman could be led to say, well, you know what? This is a game. Um, they're trying to see how much they can pile on me before I crack. So I'm not going to, I'm only going to do what I need to do to get by in that particular aspect. And so you lose out on the opportunity to develop in depth the kinds of things that you guys are doing right now, the extra, what we'll call an extracurricular activity that allows you to explore a problem. Uh, it's almost as if, well, they don't really mean it because if you did everything exactly the way they said to do it, it would be 26 hours in every day and you can't do that. Midshipmen as it is only sleep, uh, used to be true, I assume it still is, four hours a, a night would be pretty good night's sleep. Uh, that's ridiculous. Uh, seven should be minimum. And I think the institution as a whole needs to come to grips with the idea that you are not lowering standards if you ask fewer things with higher performance levels. I was on a committee, I actually chaired a committee that looked at the average number of credit hours taken by midshipmen upon graduation. It was 155. Every other university, including the one I went to, which is a pretty good little school called UCLA, requires 120, 155 hours, plus the hall, plus everything else that goes with it. So we went back in and reworked it, got it down to about 142, and wouldn't you know that I heard from old grads, oh, you're lowering the standards, right? More is not always better. That's my little sermon for the day. Um, Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> well, Dr. Simons, thank you very much for your time today. We, we appreciate it, and this has been a fascinating conversation. Good. I'm glad I could help. Good luck with your project. This concludes our interview with Dr. Simons about his career at the Naval Academy and his perspective on brigade culture. We want to thank Dr. Simons for spending his time with us and for sharing his perspective and experience. This has been the Midshipman Produced Podcast, Life at the Academy, recording from the Naval Academy's Samson Hall in Annapolis, Maryland. On behalf of the USNA History Department and our Midshipman hosts and producers, thank you for listening. We look forward to seeing you next time.